All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Premack. Uh, I'm one of your hosts for this evening. Uh, please give me your attention for a moment so I can tell you a bit about tonight's panel um, and a $500 donation, which will be made in honor of tonight's panelists to a nonprofit organization that you, the audience, will pick from a list that was nominated by the panel. Uh, Becoming is an ongoing partnership between IGDA Seattle and Diversity Collective to highlight diverse video game industry leaders and hear their stories. Tonight's panel is a second of our 2021 series, and it highlights uh, audio leaders in the video game industry. Videos of our previous panels are all available on the IGDA Seattle YouTube channel. A little about your host tonight. IGDA Seattle is a chapter of the International Game Developers Association, which is a professional association and global network of game developers with the mission of empowering game developers around the world to achieve fulfilling and sustainable careers. Diversity Collective is a community within Seattle Indies with the mission of supporting diversity and inclusion for minorities in, ga in game development. We have the opportunity tonight to learn from some experienced and diverse leaders in video game audio who are each eager to share their story with you and answer your questions. Please post your questions um, to Twitch and the moderator will ask them during the Q&A at the end of the panel. Uh, in addition, you have the opportunity tonight to pick one of the following organizations to receive a $500 donation in honor of the panelists. The five organizations are uh, Black Girls Code and their focus on providing technology education for African-American girls, races, and their mission to provide free and low cost legal services to underserved immigrant children, families, and refugees. The Stan Leopard Memorial Scholarship and their mission to carry on the legacy of Stan and enrich the Seattle game audio and music scene. The Lavender Rights Project and their mission to elevate the power, autonomy, and leadership of the Blacks intersex and gender diverse community through intersectional legal and social services and Doctors Without Borders, and their mission to deliver independent, neutral, and impartial medical aid wherever it is needed most. Uh, visit our Twitch or look for the link in the chat uh, to vote on which one of these organizations will receive tonight's donation, uh, which is sponsored by Seattle Indies and my law firm, Premac Rogers. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining us, and thank you to the IGDA for re-hosting uh, tonight's event. I hope that you will find tonight's panel both educational and encouraging as you pursue your own career paths. With that, I'll pass the mic over to tonight's moderator, August, who will introduce the panelists and kick off the discussion. August, it's all you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, welcome to our uh, audio and sound design becoming panel. Uh, each one is focused on a, a different specialty within games, and we're gonna be talking about uh, the varied paths that people take through game development. Um, and how people have overcome roadblocks to find success. Um, so we'll be answering all kinds of questions about like, the first step to get into the industry, um, where you find continued learning and growth, uh, career progression, and just what it means to be a lead in the audio uh, focus within games. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing our panelists and we'll go in the order that you're on my screen. So Kareem, if you can go first. Hello, uh, my name is Kareem Schumann. I'm a technical dialogue designer at Bungie Game Development Studios. Um, I've been working in audio in the game space for the last eight years or so, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Wilbert? Sorry, I didn't think I was next. Hey, uh, I'm Will Roger. I'm a music composer. I work in freelance. Um, some of my most recent scores were like Mortal Kombat 11 and Call of Duty World War II, uh, as well as A New the Distant Light and um, some additional music on Destiny and Guild Wars. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 15 years. Well, that's a long time. <laughs> 15 years. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for the invite. Really excited to be here. Uh, Megan, you're up next. Uh, so I'm, I'm Megan Frazier. I'm with uh, HDC as a senior sound designer on, at the Creative Labs, uh, which is kind of like the software arm for, um, you know, our greater headset, you know, hardware uh, solutions. So. Well, uh, Avril. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Avril. I am the 
the audio director at Tinker Studios. Uh, and I also am working as a sound designer at Riot. Uh, I've been in the industry, I've been in sound for about 11 years, but in the gaming industry, five. Uh, I've also worked on uh, Microsoft's mixed reality headsets and other different projects, but for right now it's Tinker Studios. And last but not least, Cameron. Hi, I'm Cameron McNair. I am currently the senior audio software engineer over at Undead Labs, working on the State of De uh, Decay franchise. Um, prior to this, I was uh, doing various um, jobs within music technology. I was working uh, in game audio at a uh, VR company um, and built a bunch of software instruments in the past too. So I want to start with a question that um, I ask on all of these panels because uh, it came up a lot in our early Q&A and I found that the answer is different in different specialties. Um, so I'm curious to hear what role college or additional cor coursework has played in your career and was that necessary for you for getting into the game industry? Um, and this is an open question for anybody. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start it off. Um, I, I am probably the unusual one in, in the room. Uh, I have no, no uh, schooling in audio. Uh, I actually graduated with a degree in business, um, international business. I spent a year in China. Um, so yeah, I sort of just picked up a microphone and pointed it at things and recorded and eventually got a little bit better at it. And you know, it kind of just worked out that way. But I am pretty weird. Mo most people go to school, so. Yeah, I think uh, my perspective is that uh, university and school programs uh, have improved a lot over the last few years. And, uh, you know, I would say eight to 10 years ago, uh, a lot of people in our industry were sort of concerned because a lot of folks would pay a lot of money and go to a private um, school of some kind that uh, that touted a great game audio program. And then they would come out of it with nothing really tangible that would translate into job opportunities. Um, my perspective is that that has, that landscape has changed significantly. And a lot of, um, a lot of audio schools and, and, and creative schools now have a much better pipeline and a stronger understanding of how to build um, career opportunities for folks who, who want to enter them. So I think that landscape has changed a lot recently. For myself, I graduated pre-med out of university. I was planning to go in a totally different field. And um, when I eventually sort of wrapped my head around a new career goal and path, I, I started tackling it by taking online courses that were affordable and seemed to be something that I could both learn from and gain something tangible out of them. So I, I, I attended online course uh, focused on WISE at the School of Video Game Audio. Um, and I took online programming courses um, in Python primarily to gain just a fundamental understanding of uh, of programming, which has been useful, not, not so much in that I, I program a lot of things, but that I can communicate and understand the, the technology aspect of our work um, much better than I could before. So that, that's my path, but, um, but that's my understanding as well. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting um, just to give a little bit of a slightly different perspective on it. Uh, yes, we, I totally agree that we have some great programs nowadays um, for, uh, for game audio specifically. Um, and for, of course, film scoring as well, there's great programs too. My perspective, however, is that I, I feel that college might be a little too early to focus entirely on the technical aspects of like, well, here's exactly how you do your job. I, I feel that it might be a good space for you to just explore and just try new things. I mean, my program uh, where I went to college, it, it had nothing to do with game or film music at all. Uh, it was just a music program. Um, and 
in doing so, I was surrounded by these other composers who are all brilliant, but they were doing nothing remotely similar to what I was interested in. Instead, they were doing art music. They were doing different kinds of folk music. I got introduced to gospel music as well, um, different types of rock music uh, too. And it was great to have all these different perspectives. It sort of led me on a journey to kind of ask different questions than someone who'd immediately just gone in and started to learn like, well, how do I sound like Hans Zimmer? Or how do I you know, do this uh, technical thing? Um, the technical stuff I ended up kind of just teaching myself. And this was what, almost fit, what, 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. So uh, you know, I think by now we're much better at YouTube and online tutorials. But um, I, I did want to just give a plug for, you know, maybe you don't necessarily need to use college as your time for learning the craft in a classroom setting, but instead maybe um, use that as a time to explore. Um, and may, perhaps the fact that, you know, both Kareem and, and Megan have had completely different experiences in college, not necessarily studying music, but studying something else, perhaps that's led them to a certain perspective that you might not have um, arrived at if you had just done uh, game audio the entire time. Uh, the one other thing I would just, uh, you know, hop off of that last statement is that like primarily my college education was about honing my ability to communicate. So like it hundred percent directly translate into anything I do. So like, again, exploration, creativity, learning how to meet people, like much more important than, oh, how do you like make a switch container, you know, based on a parameter, like, no. <laughs> on what Megan said, um, I actually kind of have like a smorgasbord of everything that you guys just spoke about. Um, I came out of school with a theater degree, so no one can tell you that theater degrees are not useful because here we are. <laughs> Um, and it was like a mishmash of all these crazy things where I learned a lot of hard technical skills, like how to run a mixer, how to sling cable, how, like Amper, just all the technical audio engineering work that was physical. But then I also learned things that were more creative in the sound design aspect of my learning. I learned how to express myself creatively, how to use my words. And then I also was taught how to stand in front of people that were that is intimidating, you know, like having these presentations and stuff like that. That was something that I learned through theater, um, how to talk to people, how to communicate, like Megan said, there were some things that I did manage to lean off of, that I did manage, that I managed to lean off of my education theatrically. Um, it also gave me like a place to fail, which was really nice, a safe plus place to mess up. If I blew an amp at school, which I did not do ever, um, <laughs> that was the place to do it. Um, but outside of that, of course, there are, you know, you do have to go out and learn things like learn how to do wise or learn how to program in Python if you want to go that hard, things like that. There's just different avenues that you can find for that that can be outside of school as well. I think that's a, a good segue if I can jump in because I mean, you're all in audio, but you all also do different things within the audio space and games. And I think um, the nuances between the different roles might not be familiar to a lot of people um, like we're looking to get an audio or even people who are in games who who aren't aware of this so between like composers audio engineers uh, sound designers we Cameron you can help at least kick us off in what the difference is between these different roles and how they work together on the team sure uh, yeah so uh, composers first of all they're obviously the ones in charge of writing all the music. Uh, may, they may or may not be actually implementing their work. Uh, I've worked on teams where uh, we, you know, have an outsourced composer we work with and they uh, deliver their stems and we, we implement them. Um, oftentimes a composer will be embedded on a team. Um, I've seen that particularly in the indie space um, more often. Um, and th then they'll be like, you know, m more of a sound designer role and, and more of a implementer as well. Um, uh, for, for sound designers, um, that's, it's a very, it's very broad and it honestly, from my experience, it's different from, uh, company to company, team to team, um, sound designers, sometimes like it'll be a small team and everyone works on all of the sounds for all the different systems in the game. Sometimes it's very granular, like maybe someone's only doing environments. Someone might only be doing gunshots or, uh, whatever. Um, so, and sound designers are uh, oftentimes implement their own work, um, like implementing as in um, with, with WISE, which is the audio middleware. Um, 
And for uh, audio engineers, uh, which is the category I fall, I fall into, um, I typically were responsible for um, maintaining the connection between WISE, uh, the middleware, and the game engine, um, as well as facilitating um, all of audio's needs for the other game systems. Like, you know, let's say uh, we need to make, you know, footsteps work in a game. Uh, the audio engineer will, uh, you know, sync up with the, with the animation team and figure out the animation systems as well as the uh, 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 like tech art team to figure out what materials that the animations are like walking on. Um, the audio engineer will typically be like the glue between all of those different game systems and middleware to, to hook that up and get that ready to go for sound designers to uh, start working with. Um, so that's, uh, that's my experience. Um, and that, that seems to be pretty, pretty common. Um, it'd be great to kind of, you know, I think, uh, you know, looking at like the different nuances of sound design, um, uh, other panelists here could probably uh, uh, have, have more to say on that uh, th than I can, but, um, but that's, uh, that's my experience. I will jump in as well and, and talk a bit about dialogue. <laughs> um, it, audio, audio folks who are focused on dialogue uh, is, is not as common in our industry, but it's becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Um, at Bungie, our audio team is, is sort of split into three branches, sound design, music, and dialogue. And uh, for Destiny, uh, the title that we, uh, we work on and, and ship regularly, the, uh, the amount of lines and content that's coming out and needs to, needs to be delivered uh, with every live release is, is large enough and constant enough that we have a team for it. And that work is a combination of implementation on our side uh, and working with voiceover talent, working closely with narrative design and creating uh, well-timed uh, and good sounding dialogue content that functions and has a smooth pipeline from recording session into gameplay, uh, which is, uh, which has its own sort of unique set of challenges, but does involve a lot of the same sort of skills and, and working that sound design does. Uh, I, for all of you, I'm curious to hear, like, what was your first role into the game industry, whether it was in audio or not, um, and what some of the biggest contributors were to uh, early career growth and, and where you found support early in your career? Um, so uh, Avril, I don't know if you could kind of lead us in on, on this. Sure. Um, so I started uh, doing uh, architectural showrooms in VR with Ashley and Megan. Both of us uh, worked together to, to make an experience and implement audio and also record audio, Foley work and such like that. Um, so that was, that was my first one. Um, it was all in Unreal. It was everything, well, this was before meta sounds and stuff like that. This was like years ago actually now um but yeah it was just it was my first real ability to put in like everything that I had learned and taught myself or learned off on blind and put it in a real work situation uh so you know, obviously my, my first role was with our role uh they they were a little bit more on the technical side I was a little bit more on the creative side um we worked oh that was a really fun client um so I do, will say though, though I do kind of usually put my first role as, as my, um, uh, my opportunity at Microsoft. Uh, I got to release um, for Altspace VR, the Quest launch uh, environments. They have like, like home spaces and that kind of thing. Um, and I will say once you get a large name that people recognize, um, all of a sudden it gets so much easier. Um, like callbacks is easier, getting interviews is easier. Um, people are just way, way more interested in talking to you. Um, it's just a long dark slog to get there. Yeah, it can be extremely lengthy. I mean, I, I've been trying to get into game audio since like high school, basically I've been writing and um, my first sort of big break was uh, being hired at LucasArts. And I was hired as a music assistant doing a lot of music editing and uh, eventually music implementation. Um, 
But the funny thing is before that, I was doing the same job that I have now, just much less successful at it, <laughs> doing the whole freelance music composer thing um, for a lot of indie projects, most of which didn't really go anywhere. Um, but once I was at LucasArts, uh, I noticed that we had a lack of support in terms of the implementation of the music. We were relying on level designers to hook things up and all that. And so I said, well, why don't I just teach myself um, the programming languages that we were using? We were using Lua, but Python and Lua were pretty similar. So I took a Python class and I took on those responsibilities and kind of rose in the ranks at LucasArts by being basically the implementation person for both music and um, sometimes even sound design, people would ask me for help. Uh, and I kind of cheated my way into being the composer as well. As the story goes, I overheard that they were looking for a fifth composer for Star Wars, The Old Republic. And, you know, many times during my employment, I was told like, well, you're not here to write music, you're here to help with whatever. But I figured, well, I'm also already on staff, you know, you're already paying me, why shouldn't I write music? So literally the first day that I overheard that, I ran home, wrote a demo piece, came in the next morning and just kind of forced them to listen to it. And long story short, I ended up writing about an hour of music for the game. And that was my first, um, you know, AAA game music credit um, for that reason. Yeah, I, I also started in the indie space um, as a sound designer, primarily working on projects, many of which never saw the light of the day. And I was actually at GDC. Uh, I had met some new friends, indie, fo you know, indie game developers, people my own age. And I was complaining about how I was doing all this work for very little money. And I wasn't even getting credits out of it because it wasn't shipping. And one of now my best friends uh, at the time, I had only known him for a week or so said, well, I'm working on a game and it's definitely going to ship. I've got a date for myself and it's set and it's going to ship uh, September. And I could really use sound design if you definitely want something that will be a credit. And I said, okay. And uh, we shipped that on the Wii U on Nintendo, which was great. And then um, that was all sort of me moonlighting. I had a full-time job as an IT desktop support role. And then I really wanted to start doing full-time game dev work, even if it wasn't audio necessarily. And so I started applying for contract QA roles. And, uh, and I did a few of those, um, which was very valuable and helpful, but uh, also stressful and, and challenging in their own ways. And then um, was very pleased when I found out about this Bungie audio QA role because it meant I could work directly with the audio team at Bungie, utilizing my QA skills, which I had been developing for a couple of years. And, uh, and that really put me in close proximity with an amazing team. And I, I started learning a lot very, very quickly. And that helped me to then be well positioned when they needed someone to focus on dialogue um, because I, had, I was already familiar with the system and I, and I knew what it, what it could do. Uh, I'm curious to hear too. Uh, Turn uh, yeah, I uh, have been building. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You started for a second. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, I've been building music, interactive music systems for uh, a while now. Um, ever since I kind of really discovered like Max MSP and Pure Data um, tools like that. Um, and after a few years of, of doing that for my own work and uh, building various software instruments as a freelancer, I uh, came across an opportunity with a um, VR company um, that wanted to do an interactive music game. And um, it sounded like a really good opportunity to jump in and try something new. And uh, I ended up yeah, shipping that after a year and just kind of started doing Unreal projects. And now, um, yeah, five years later, been doing that ever since. Wait, what did you ship? Uh, it's a game called Electronauts. It's oh, an interactive yep. yeah, music game, yeah, from a few years ago now. Yeah. I'm curious for, for anyone who wants to answer, I mean, in these early roles, where, where did you find support and how did you grow? Was it from resources inside the company that you were at? Was it through like senior mentorship? 
inside or outside the company, uh, like continued education classes outside, like how did you leverage that and, and grow from being a junior in the industry and progressing your career? Well, what I mentioned was um, within LucasArts, there were like different enrichment um, programs that you could just sign up for for free. Uh, usually it would just be like either during lunch or like after work and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I, did, I signed up for the one teaching Python. Uh, I never thought that I could code anything because my brain is just a little too small for that, but they simplified it and they made it um, a tangible uh, goal. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to talk about like outside of the company, like what, what you can do, uh, like various meetups um, have been like really useful for my career. I, uh, I even met Will, like I met you like at least 10 years ago when you're at LucasArts uh, and like I met you and um, a, a, a few other uh, folk in the game industry that really kind of every, every year or two sometimes would just email back and forth and kind of get an idea of what, what tech to learn, what kind of uh, direction to go in and um, you know, keep, keeping contacts warm and, and, and creating new contacts is, I think, a really, really good way to do that. Just even if it's just to um, have, have an ear on like what technology to really learn next. Um, that, that is something that really helped me personally. Um, I think that for when you're freelance and you aren't in house yet, it can be very challenging. Um, so I, I would definitely say that, I mean, Avril and I basically formed our own community, kind of, um, a little bit. Um, that being said, there are small, what I what I call secret garden communities. Um, they're like industry secrets where they aren't like secret secret, but you, you talk to people and they say, oh, did you know that there's a, a coffee meetup every Friday? You know, th th like it's all who do you know and kind of you just sort of eventually find the groups a little bit. Um, Avril, you're going to say something. You look like you wanted to say something. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think that finding those, those groups and finding the mentorship in the community part is very important um, because the long slog is a very, very dark place. You, you have to, you have to get through it and it takes a long time. I would say that um, a big part of my growth has been actually the community itself. I went to a lot of hackathons. I went to a lot of VR hackathons. I went to, um, I haven't gone to an indie, indie game one, which I want to, but I have the, everything just kind of happened. But a lot of the hackathons, I met really good friends through the hackathons that I like hang out when I get a chance to and talk to about what's going on in the world. And then just also talk about just games. Like, I think I've, I've met Will a couple times, actually, in some of these hackathons. I've met Megan, I met for the first time at a VR hackathon, my first one. Um, but just a lot of people like building, going out into the community and just meeting people with like-minded ideas and wants, you know, that's the best thing you could really do to like, I, I personally, I think, to grow because it's nice to have somebody to, you know, help you and also look at things from a different perspective. Yeah, uh, game jams. Um, that is something a lot of people uh, go uh, like uh, go to uh, frequently and enjoy. Um, I, I know a lot of people who really uh, kickstarted their career by doing just a bunch of game jams and meeting people. Uh, there's there's a really strong like there, there's a, a specific magic that happens at game jams and in those communities that I think um, can be uh, really encouraging and uh, for for a lot of people. And if you're if you're eligible to work in the United States, I also really highly recommend um, applying for the GDC CA program, which are the people who work the show. Um, GDC is a very difficult, uh, is a very expensive and sort of prohibitively expensive conference to attend. But if you're able to get to San Francisco and you're eligible to work, you can apply to basically work the show. And it's an amazing program where you'll meet a lot of people at a lot of different levels, like people who are entry level, who are new, people who have been a part of that program in GDC for like 20 years, who are, you know, top of their field. And it's a, it's a big part of how I met a lot of amazing people that helped me at various stages in my career. And I was very fortunate to um, have heard about them and, and found out about it. 
for, for people who are just getting started in audio now, like they're just starting to interview, they're putting together their portfolio, they're applying for jobs. What, what are like common mistakes that either that you've made or you've seen people make that they should avoid or pitfalls will fall into? Um, and like, how, how can they stand out amongst other applicants to, to get noticed by a studio? Um, I would say that the, in my experience, which is fairly limited, uh, the biggest thing that they fail to do is network with smaller developers. Um, this is a people business. Uh, it's, it's very, very dependent on who you know. Uh, so networking with smaller houses who aren't, you know, the, the, the Halo 343s of, of the world, it's not that, that you should just ignore them. Um, or that you shouldn't apply. Uh, but I think that the the number of people that I've just kind of reached out to that were just solo devs or solo artists or just all of those things, and eventually it led to something um, it, much, much greater. Um, there's also a, a shorter path between having nothing to having something for your portfolio. Um, whereas unless, you just have everything already it approaching something like like a big studio uh you you don't get anything until i i'm not explaining this very well <laughs> no it, it definitely makes sense i think a lot of people like just starting out they're sort of like the big names that everybody knows and they think of those and maybe don't like do research into like what other different types of companies exist in games like there's so many different types of games in terms of genre and studio size and yeah, that you should expand your search. I think that's good advice. Yeah, you don't you don't need to start off by making content that you yourself are a fan of wanting to play. I think that's that's a common pitfall. I think a lot of people look at the games that they love playing and they want to work on them. And I think that's that's a totally exciting and, and worthwhile goal, but that's that can be a really challenging ask when you're starting out. I think recognizing that you need to cast a wide net and, and talk to people at, in all different areas, even if it's not content that you yourself are in love with, um, that's okay. It, it's good work and work is what you need um, more so than, than uh, making content that you yourself are a fan of. I think another thing that I would say also, like I remember this from the beginning is just just do something, like just just go and do something. You're, it's okay to fail because the faster you fail, the better you get. The more lessons you learn from that, just just do it. Go go Nike style and just do it. Make that real, no matter what sound effects you have, no matter what bird sound you got that is not the right bird. Just just do it and put it out there. Practice. That's one of the bigger ones I would say. You know, I have I have two kind of pieces of advice. One of them is a little controversial and feel free to dismiss it because it's just my opinion. But um, as someone who sometimes sometimes is in a position of hiring, I like to see a see some degree of focus. I know that a lot of times people just want to do game audio and, you know, maybe that means that they want to do music, but they also think, well, there's so many positions available for sound design. So why don't I do sound design as well? But here's the problem with that. They are both extraordinarily difficult. They require a lot of technical knowledge as well as creative knowledge. And being quite frank, they're both extraordinarily expensive. It is very expensive to do uh, sound design or music with all the gear that you need, the software, uh, the sound libraries, the, the sample libraries, all of that. It's very expensive and you can't really, I mean, well, you can, anything is possible, don't get me wrong, but it's very difficult and I would argue needlessly so, to try to do both at the same time. I think it's a better idea to sort of ask yourself and be very honest with yourself, which of these do I think of when I'm waking up in the morning and when I go to bed at night? What is on my mind all the time? I think you'll have an answer for that. And I would recommend that you find ways to approach that uh, exclusively rather than to try to do everything and, um, and hope that something sticks. 
that said, I mean, I do know some sound designers who are incredible composers and some people who do both music and sound design to an astonishingly good level. So it's not impossible, but um, it's just, in my opinion, sort of a needless hard mode. <laughs> I remember we were um, talking about community groups as well as being support networks for this kind of thing. So I want to, uh, and we're all, all a part of a lot of the same communities, but I got a ping. Uh, I should also just call out we've got a bunch of different like community groups and discords involved and people putting on this panel. So like the IGDA groups and the Seattle Indies Discord. Um, IGDA Seattle has a discord as well um, that where you can connect with other developers um, and we also have a work with Indies group that helps to like push forward some of the open, open positions for audio designers and things like that um, and job boards. So for people who are currently looking for work, that's a place where you can get connected um, and find mentorship as well. Um, yeah, before we before we move off, I, I also want to call out that, you know, look at job postings at the places you would like to work and read those job postings all the way down. Don't don't just. Um, focus on three shipped yep. titles as a composer. Look look to see what else they're interested in at the sort of places you would like to work. Do they want a uh, middleware experience? How can you showcase that you know how to work with WISE or FMOD? Do they, do they ask, um, do they say this position will need to work closely with design or um, that you'll be implementing content that you'll be communicating, that they want someone who's familiar with um, with their business systems or that worked on a live game or mobile game specifically. Like, look look for the, the specifics of what the sort of companies you're excited about or teams you're excited to work on are looking for and try to develop those specific skills in addition to becoming a better sound designer, a better composer, because that is the meat, but it's not the whole sandwich. <laughs> Uh, I would also say that a big part of the whole sandwich is figuring out who got the job afterwards. Uh, after a posting disappears, it'll be about eight weeks afterwards, you'll be able to see the person who actually got the role. Uh, looking at their portfolio of where they're at currently is very helpful, as well as how many years of experience they had when you were going toe to toe with them. Um, it's, it's easy if you have a lot of connections on LinkedIn. Um, I was a recruiter in a former life, so I have the entirety of LinkedIn. Uh, connect with me if you need to, but you, you should be able to find them. That's a really cool idea. I never thought of that. That's awesome. Um, so I want to shift the conversation a little bit because I mean, part of the reason that we're all here is to um, represent a, a more diverse view of the game industry and traditionally games lack uh, a lot of diversity and I'm curious to hear how the audio community has compares in terms of its inclusion and equity um, and what initiatives you are currently doing or what initiatives you have to improve DNI and game audio. I'd, I'd like to jump in. Um, so uh, unfortunately from what I've seen uh, game audio really doesn't it has less diversity than other games teams um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem and something, uh, as a gay person, as an openly gay person, I, I have personal stake in this. I want more diversity. I want more voices that can help make our game better. That's how your projects get better. That's how you learn. That's how everyone learns. So I, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, it's certainly a big issue at Undead Labs. Um, and I think there are, like it's a it's a very systemic issue as you know we all know and uh, I, I think w one of the uh, areas that a company can focus on or a team could focus on is their interviewing practice and how they test candidates um, you know are, are is someone with an anxiety disorder can they succeed in your interview loop how about someone with a learning disability how about someone who can't buy all the plugins um, so I think like like thinking about like candidates with with those kind of uh like different experiences like is and formulating your interview loop around that um i think can help like bring diversity to your specific team um and that's something that you know my team looks very closely at and uh, you know we we're trying our best now in engineering and in audio to to, to do that um and it uh has 
helps tremendously. Um, a lot, we have like far more women on our engineering team now than we did a year and a half ago. Um, so it's, I know it's possible, but I, I think interviewing, the interviewing loop, you know, is, is, a, is a big one. Um, also the, the um, learning institutions, educational institutions can um, have a lot of changes there to, to open it up to more candidates as well. Yeah, kind of echoing um, what Cameron mentioned. Uh, I, I can't stress enough how expensive this job is. I mean, even at an entry level, uh, you can often be pitted against someone who has a whole studio built out. And it's like, hey, good luck doing this sound design test. And you're competing against someone who can afford every single library, who can you know do all of these things. Um, in addition to that, I think that the world of game audio also has an additional challenge in that uh, historically audio employees tend to stay around longer than any other, um, any other discipline. Your guess is as to why I think that's irrelevant, but we tend, tend to stay around longer and there are fewer of us than like the art team, which might have a hundred people or, or more and all that. And so what that means is that there are fewer openings and people have a tendency to hire within their social circle. So that's kind of the background as to why um, it tends to be quite homogenous. It's the prohibitive cost and just the fewer openings and the fact that there is, once again, a tendency to hire within your social, social circle. And I think uh, Cameron has hit the nail on the head in terms of um, what we can do to improve. Uh, looking at and really examining how we're hiring new talent, I think is very important. Um, one suggestion that's come up in previous uh, panels was that maybe we don't allow sound designers to do the sound design test and use whatever they want. Maybe we provide them with sounds that they're allowed to use and impress us, show us something creative, do something cool with what you, what you have, because realistically that's how it's going to be when you have the job anyway. Um, there's also been talk about, do we even need a sound design test for an entry level position? Is that even necessary? Maybe there's other skills that are more soft skills, uh, which is such a weird term because they're so important. Why would you call it soft? But regardless, maybe there's other uh, aspects to it uh, that would be more useful for taking someone from the very beginning of their career into developing them into a very uh, productive member of the team. And a lot of the time, they're not even hiring for entry-level roles, right? Because these jobs are so in demand, it's very easy to try for a development team to go, well, last time we had a sound design or composer job opening, 800 people applied within the first four days. So if we, we can reduce the number and ensure we get very high quality pool of candidates by saying you need to have six years in this industry experience. And that way we're not dealing with the flood of incoming, we're dealing with you know, a more manageable number and they're all gonna be awesome. But when, by recognizing that when you're doing that, you're actively reducing the diversity uh, of the candidates that you can look at. Because as much improvement as this industry has made, it has only made that improvement kicking and screaming over the last you know, seven, eight years, maybe uh, one could argue. So when you say, I need eight years experience, I need 10 years experience, you need to have shipped this many titles before you can even apply or be considered. Realistically, what you're saying is uh, anyone who is starting out or anyone who managed to, to, to start working in this industry more recently, who is likely from a more diverse group, you're, you're not welcome. So that's another thing that, that, um, I recommend challenging and looking at if you're in a position to do so in your in your company. As for something that I've been working on, I, I'm part of the diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives at Bungie. Um, we have a um, diversity committee, and we have our own ERGs, what we call inclusion clubs, um, for that any employee can start and and self identify. Um, and so I'm one of, uh, I'm one of the co-leads for Black at Bungie, uh, which is one of those inclusion clubs and, and leader of the diversity committee. And we talk about things sort of all up. It's not audio focused. So, um, 
that area of it is doesn't connect to what we're doing here, but, but it is about uh, a lot of it also that we haven't spoken on is retention. Once you've hired uh, folks, once you're, company is starting to make strides and improvements into, into being a more diverse space, what are you doing to ensure that those individuals are being treated inclusively and equitably and, um, and want to stay? Because um, that's, a, that's a challenge in and of itself. If, you, if you're not training, if you're not working on communication, if you're not doing audits and ensuring that they're being treated fairly and compensated fairly. Um, these are all areas that um, those who have been in this industry for a long time and, and don't have to worry about diversity uh, will be happy to ignore. But those who are diverse, who are newer hires, who are coming up, will look around and sort of go, why am I being treated differently? Why do I feel unwelcome in the spaces that I'm in? Why is it that I've been working longer than anyone else on this team, but I'm the lowest level employee out of anyone in this group? And that leads to departure. That leads to people leaving this industry. That leads to hard feelings. And, um, and it's not right. Um, so that's, that's another really big thing to think about. Not only how do you do a better job of hiring more diverse groups, but what are you doing to ensure that when they do get there and they, they're excited and they're happy to be there in the beginning, that they continue to be happy and that they're, you're setting them up for success to do their best work and, and that they feel welcome and, and included. I was going to say uh, one last thing, sorry. Um, but like even before, even before the interviewing process and before all this, I think something that's really, really important is also outreach is making sure that you're going to marginalized communities, homes, people, schools, like rural schools and just letting them know, hey, this is an option. You can have a job doing this. You like music, guess what? You can make music and games. Like if I would have known that when I was younger, that would have made my process a lot faster. And that also grows the pool of hiring because right now I know some of the issues is that we just don't have enough people to hire who are diverse candidates. And that's unfortunate. So I think outreach is also something that's very important to do. I'm curious here. Now that, could, could I give uh, a point about outreach? Just an example. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. I, I wanted to quickly plug um, two organizations. Uh, one is the Black in Game Audio Discord. It's a Discord channel um, where it sort of has two aims. One is, yeah, it's a place where we can speak openly and about any issues that are coming up, uh, philosophize about, you know, how do we change things? How do we make a better world for game audio? Um, as well as it's also been a place uh, for recruiting. So we've had uh, job openings being posted there. And on that same token, but a little bit more broadly, there is an organization called the Composers Diversity Collective. Um, you can literally just look that up. Uh, we ha that has its own website. And what's great about that community is it actually has a full on database of every member listing them by uh, their name, what their, uh, their specialty is like musically, as well as their native language and their location. And uh, this group is, is more broad. It's not just for video games, but it's also like for film and television. And the idea is um, they were a little bit sick and tired of producers in the film industry saying, oh, we can't find, we can't find anyone who is of a different race. So we just hired the same people over again. Well, guess what? Now you have a elegant database <laughs> listing everyone. And there's so much talent there and they have monthly meetups. I highly encourage um, not only people who are in a position of hiring to look there, but also if you are a composer um, who identifies uh, with an underrepresented uh, race to please consider joining uh, because it's been a great group. Well, thank you for the resources, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious to hear more like now We've talked a lot about the juniors and like getting into the industry and finding support there, but are there challenges or roadblocks that you've faced in trying to move into a leadership position for the first time um, coming, coming out of mid-career? Um, and I know we've talked a lot about like uh, on previous panels where salary negotiation, looking for that promotion, looking for the title of senior or the title of lead um, can sometimes be a challenge for people. So I'm curious to hear your perspectives on 
how this was for you or, or um, how that it, how that works in the in the audio field specifically. Uh, as an engineer, um, one of the biggest steps for me was to constantly advocate for the audio team, like when they weren't in the room, um, like with all the different disciplines and all the different discipline conversations that happened. Um, that, um, yeah, that was like definitely a really big step, you know, knowing like uh, what what t kind of support my, the audio team would need, uh, like from, you know, a discussion about like character movement or something, or uh, maybe our tech art pipeline, um, you know, uh, and being able to like make those call outs and be able to, um, you know, relay all that informa information better. Um, so yeah, I guess the, in summary, uh, communication and advocating um, is like a, a really big component in the engineering, uh, on the engineering side of things um, to really kind of step into that, that role. Because um, if I don't do it, like a, like a lot of uh, other engineers don't have the same ears as I do and don't, you know, really know what the nuances of spatialization or acoustics are. Um, and, uh, you know, it's as the audio engineer, it's kind of my job to advocate for those systems and uh, provide that support. Uh, I, I got some really great advice from one of my coworkers a few years back when I brought up the topic of leadership. And she said to me that leadership is sort of a catch-22. Folks want to ask themselves if they're in a position of promoting you or, or hiring you, is this person capable of being a good leader? And really the only way they can know that is if they have evidence or have seen you in action being a good leader. And that's a very challenging thing to try to accomplish as you're moving up within a company. If you, unless you have somebody who's just willing to, to place their faith in you basically and say, I think you will be good at this, but I don't know. And so I took that advice to me to take any opportunity to showcase my leadership skills and also to make an effort to start performing like a leader in my day-to-day -day work uh, with, with the cooperation of my manager, by which I mean solving problems without asking first and instead communicating as I'm doing. So sort of sharing out the, the solution as I'm putting it into practice rather than asking for help originally if it felt like this was something I was already capable of doing and then waiting for people to see if they would raise their hand and go, uh, why are we doing it this way? This is, there could be a better way, in which case then that's a situation to sit down and talk about it. I, I've found that a lot of times people get exhausted just being asked for their input in decisions if they feel like they're not the expert in it. And if you feel like you're the person who understands the situation best, then putting forward your proposed solution and starting to work on it and communicating it out as you're doing it and then asking for help if you hit a wall or reaching out as needed is a great way for people to see you in a position of uh, that person is simply doing things, recognizing problems, solving it and leading us towards solutions rather than putting yourself in a position where folks go, yeah, they, they're very skilled, but they seem unsure and they keep reaching out and asking for permission. Um, it's a difficult thing and it requires a certain amount of confidence and trust with the people you work with. And so it's not something I recommend for everyone to just jump in and start doing right away, but to feel out and figure out what are the things you believe you are the expert in in your field and looking for those opportunities to start leading the conversation rather than asking first and, and getting permission. The one thing, uh, Will, that you mentioned before is that uh, audio specifically requires a lot of equipment and a lot of tools uh, to do the work. Um, and over COVID, everybody's gone remote and might not have access to the same equipment they did at work. So 
I think it's kind of a, a two for one question that I want to ask, which is one, um, like what resources do, um, do, can people use if they don't have access to equipment to like start working on this at home? And also what has worked for you all to transition remotely and still be able to do your job? And um, how have you kept the field accessible um, and, and been able to continue working? Um, like what has been, what, what tools have made you uh, been able to be successful working remotely? Uh, Megan, I don't, I don't know if this is something that you can speak to uh, or anyone else who wants to jump in. Yeah, so um, uh, at HTC, we have a fully decked out, like the full recording studio. Um, so my workflow is split between audio tests that absolutely have to be done in studio. Uh, so even though the, the office is technically closed, um, there's just certain things, especially dialogue driven, um, that have to have that fidelity that I just don't have in a, in a home setup. Um, and that again, plays into the diversity thing. Um, because now, uh, in, after COVID, um, we're now asking our sound designers to have fully fledged out studios at home, um, versus, like, I mean, there's probably two grand worth of headphones right in this call right now, but um, that it's a lot to ask um, because most juniors do not have the, the $20,000 studio um, at home. Um, I will say that there is the one thing that is good about it is that it does level the playing field a little bit that someone who's in Peoria has a chance to even apply Whereas in 2019, their application would never ever make it to a hiring authority, probably. In fact, when I was applying for the internship to HDC uh, because my contract at Altspace had ended, I almost didn't apply because I, I kind of view all applications just as throwing it into the digital dumpster fire. I assume that I will never make it to a hiring authority, um, even though I had Microsoft on my resume. Um, and I think that when you're earlier in your career, that's why you have to be networking so hard one-on-one -on -one because you're, you're never, you're not making it to the hiring authority is the hard part. Does anyone else have a, a, like tips on, on resources on how, how this can be more accessible for people to get access to this and, and work remotely if, right now? Well, you're nodding, so. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> the, the funny thing is that, like, this is kind of an unfair question for me because I've always been, you know, even when I was at Lucas, I still had all of my gear from when I was a freelancer. Um, but the thing is, I've also always been incredibly cheap and incredibly frugal compared at least to everyone else that I've encountered. And the way I've made it work was that I'm very careful about what I buy. Mm -hmm. And I always try to make sure to take advantage of when there's, you know, maybe maybe uh, Waves or whatever big plug-in company has like their thing, but maybe number one, there could be a free alternative and you can keep an eye out for those. Um, some companies to look out for are like Air Windows. All of his stuff is free and he has 200 amazing plugins. Uh, there's also like um, Analog Obsession and he's also got like a hundred unbelievably good plugins that are way better than the costly alternatives, I promise you. Um, you can look into um, just being very strategic about what you buy and when. I would say that your first purchase obviously should be your DAW um, and, of course, the computer to run it. But uh, I use Reaper, which is like a $40 program, but it's gotten so huge in game audio for a number of reasons. And um, once you have that, then it's like, okay, well, now the, the floodgates are open. You can do whatever you want. And it comes with its own plugins, which are actually better than you would think, given their terrible looking basic UI. Uh, and also Native Instruments Contact. It's a uh, basically a sampler, but it can do so much. You can create your own samples. And there's so many free sample libraries out there that you can then use. And so for only um, you know, X hundred dollars, you now have basically all of the gear that you would need to compete with someone who's been spending thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars building up their huge synth racks and, and all that. Um, so that's, that's my advice is to just be very careful about what you purchase. 
I also have always mixed on headphones. I know that is going to ruffle a few feathers and some people are going to be like, you're not a real musician if you're, you know, whatever. But um, it de-necessitated having a fully treated uh, room for mm -hmm. many, many years, many years. And uh, I just made sure that, hey, yeah, what I'm, what I'm doing, I understand my headphones. I, I've worked with them for years upon years and there's no surprises in the mix. If, even if I take it into like a, a car, which is like the worst possible place to listen to your music. But if you know your headphones well enough, then it'll survive the car test as well. Um, as far as sound design goes and uh, recording, once again, this is where I'm going to have to plug the Twitterverse. Uh, if you follow hashtag game audio on Twitter, or if I'm being real, I'll just be real. There's certain specific people on, on Twitter that you must follow. I can't remember their exact Twitter handles, but look up like Steven Schapler. I think he's at Sony now. He used to be at NetherRealm. Aaron Brown, Aaron Brown Sound. Uh, Nick Von Kainel, I think is his name. And uh, Ash Reed. These are incredible sound designers who are constantly posting their techniques and things that they've uh, purchased. Or they're like, hey, this is cool. Check this out. Um, you'll just get access to so much great information about sound design if you follow these people. Um, and just in general, like Discord communities, big and small, especially the small ones, if you can find them, uh, are great places to get information on like, hey, here's the latest and greatest. Um, you don't have to just buy the super expensive brand names that everyone knows about. You can get something for cheap or for free that's just as good or better. Um, and so that's kind of how I would, I would recommend, um, especially if you're just starting out and you don't want to spend, you know, colossal amounts of, of money on something that's just going to be obsolete in, in a few years. Yeah, I, I want to jump in as well. Uh, I know we're, we're low, low on time. It's okay. I, just, I just want to say that if you're, if you're in a freelance position, plus one to everything, we'll just said, but also... Uh, look to see what you what position you're in that is an advantage. If you are a musician and you have a bunch of musician friends or you know someone who you're really tight with who's a great cellist, guess what? You're featuring cellos in your music <laughs> because you can probably get that person to record for you and get much better content than if you were just using MIDI. If you live out in the woods, guess what? You're doing some really cool ambience stuff that you can get really easily that other people would have to travel really far or buy a sample library to get. So look around, look to see what you have access to that can be your superpower in those moments. If you're already working and you're with a company or you're with a team, even if it's a small team, don't be afraid to ask for the truly necessary things that you need to succeed. If you need to raise your hand and go, look, friends, I need this sample library because we're doing a bunch of explosions in our game. And guess what? I can't record explosions, okay? That's not, that's not happening. So we need to, put, you know, I'm not paying for this out of my own budget. This needs to come out of the game budget. We need to spend, you know, $200 on this. This is from my research, the best sample pack that we can get. And I'm gonna do stuff to it to make it unique to our content. If you need equipment, if you need software, as long as you're being smart and you're not over, overdoing it, asking for the things that you need rather than suffering in silence. And, you know, the worst thing they could say is no, and you're still in the same position you're in now. So that's something I've actually had to remind myself of working from home for major studio is just sort of like, oh, I can just ask. Uh, I, I kind of forgot, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I could use some, some better gear for some of the stuff I'm doing and, we, we need to have a budget for that. That can't just all come out of my, my own pocket if it's primarily for work. Well, so we're, we're getting uh, close to the end here. So we're going to be moving on to our live Q&A session. Um, so if you are watching and you have questions for the panelists, drop them in the Twitch chat and we'll answer them here. Um, there've been a few that have come through already. So we're going to try to do these sort of lightning round style. So maybe one or two people uh, come on and answer the question and then we'll try to move through them uh, somewhat quickly. The first one is specifically for Cameron. Uh, there's someone that would like to know more about the software instruments that Cameron worked on. Um, so maybe you can give a uh, kind of brief detail on, on what that was. 
Sure. Uh, yeah. So I specifically worked on uh, contact instruments. Uh, it's the sampler that Will was just talking about. Um, I actually don't know if the company is still around anymore, um, but they were called Umlaut Audio. Uh, we we uh, worked with a bunch of different composers, uh, building um, custom instruments for them in their films. Um, yeah, they uh, aren't, I, I think they have a few instruments now that are on their commercial store that uh, you should totally check out. Um, but yeah, most of the work I did was uh, specific to um, composers uh, in the industry. But yeah, it was all in contact. So contact's great. Well, uh, we have another question here. What are some things folks should work on or know well if they want to get into a career in games? Are there, I, I'm gonna kind of interpret this as like, is there a base set of like, this is something you should know if you're applying for, for audio? Uses a lot of uh, things. <laughs> <yeah>. Megan? <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say practice listening. Um, it, your ears are the most important part. Like it's not about the gear. It's not about fidelity with microphones or, or synths or plugins or anything like that. It's all about your ear. Everything else is secondary. Um, to, to jump onto that, um, definitely a lot of uh, ear training. So like listen to your environments, go outside and do just listening exercises, try to figure out, try to break down your environments. Um, I'm speaking from the sound design perspective. I'm sure there's things that you can do as a composer that is more towards that. But as a sound designer, I find that like even going to things like there's this website called Sound Gym um, where you can just like figure out like it'll it, it'll train your ears like an ear training website that will help you like figure out like, oh, there's a bump in the 500 frequency range or something like that. And you can listen to that and it trains you. It's like little exercises and stuff like that. And that that helps a lot when it comes to um, when it comes to sound design in general. That's awesome. I didn't know that that uh, website, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, that's I new to me that. too. The music 10, 10. version, I think, of, of that uh, concept is uh, advice that I give literally everyone and no one takes. How about that? But I would say transcription. Find a piece that's in the same genre or style or whatever that you are about to write in and transcribe it note for note, just by ear. Almost every single score that I've, uh, I've ever written I started off by uh, transcription, transcribing something. Like if I'm doing a Star Wars score, I'll transcribe a Williams cue. Or if I'm doing, uh, like before Mortal Kombat, I transcribed a bunch of uh, taiko drum ensembles. Um, there was another score I did where I did a bunch of uh, Slavic, um, Slavic women's chorus music, folk music. It's a great way to just make sure that you're digesting music in the same way that people who have been writing in this genre their whole lives are. And it's a great way to sort of influence your own writing and your own uh, way of thinking. Um, we have another question from the chat, if you're okay with this, moving on for I'm sorry. Um, what are some of the challenges you face specifically as uh, BIPOC, female or non-binary people and how can the industry or others in the industry better support you against those challenges? Kind of a big question but uh, I, I guess I can I can take that a little bit if that, that, that's okay um yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges is my pronouns <laughs> um the the in I the I do my best to to tell people beforehand hey my name is Avril my pronouns are they them and that usually goes well but you know sometimes you'll have um you'll have someone who just doesn't want to use them or, or anything like that. And as a person who is outside, the person who's, I guess, non POC or something like that, you can always also stand up and say something. That makes the biggest difference and that makes us feel safe. I know that makes me feel safe. If I get misgendered or something like that, and then my friend is like, hey, their pronouns were this, and or something like that, that makes a world of difference right there. Being open about having these conversations is also a really big thing personally, um, having these conversations and being allowed to speak about them is a big thing too. Um, I, I've been fortunate in that I'm aware of a lot of situations that folks have been in that are a lot more uh, traumatic or upsetting than the situations I've personally had to deal with in, in my work. Uh, I would say that 
it's important to be an advocate in as much as you can, by which I mean being active, uh, asking to help, listening to what the folks around you are saying, believing them, and stepping up to ask, how can I help? And then doing something. Uh, those are all really great steps in general that can be followed in almost any situation. Personally, something that I'm working on and trying to deal with is a lot of the work I've been doing and, and focus I've been giving to diversity and inclusion. And in my career is sort of questioning whether or not this is taking away from the career growth that I could be having without it. And would I be better at dialogue or sound design if I wasn't splitting my time in these ways? And uh, this is an interesting challenge to be a part of this question of now that we are creating spaces and inviting folks from underrepresented communities to organize and be a part of the change and, and direct uh, energy into making our companies or our communities safer, more inclusive, more diverse. What are we doing to compensate and reward those individuals for that very real emotional labor that they're being asked to do to help themselves and people uh, that will be coming after them? And that's something that I think we shouldn't be ignoring as well. That's a really good point. Sorry. Just commending Kareem on, on this point. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead, Will. Uh, um, you know, it's always been a challenge to be taken seriously. You know, especially at trade shows or, you know, where you might be at GDC and someone meets like 100 people in a day. Being taken seriously when you don't like look the part of like, oh, well, clearly this guy is going to be great at game audio. But you, when you don't look like that, it can be very, very difficult. People can be very dismissive. And let's be very real just for a second. Uh, I apologize for, you know, whatever. But we're not looked on. And I'm talking about everyone in game audio, not just people of color or, or whichever. But we're not looked at as like the person that I really need to talk to usually. Usually people see a programmer and they're like, oh yeah, oh, in the work of Google. Oh my gosh, I have to talk to them. But I've literally heard so many stories of people going to GDC and having a nice conversation with someone. And as soon as they find out that you do audio, they're like, well, I got to go, bye. You know, and that's, uh, that's the end of that. And it's just something that you have to internalize and realize like, okay, it, it sucks quite frankly, but we have to find a way to get past that. And um, even, and the funny thing is like, even once you have amassed a massive, a number of credits, a mountain of credits, you're still kind of treated with this like suspicion at, at these game events, even game audio events. If people don't like specifically know who you are, it's sort of like, I don't know about, about that one. And the only cure to this as the person of color, as the person who's in audio, as the, you know, whatever, uh, is to be consistent, consistently show up to GDC, cons or game, sorry, consistently show up to the Game Developers Conference, consistently go to Game Sound Con, to IGDA events uh, that are local, and any kind of local meetups that you can find. This will let people know that you're in it for the long haul, that you're taking it very seriously, uh, and that you are legitimate. Similarly, it's important to have a very concise and effective elevator pitch the term elevator pitch, I don't know where it comes from, maybe business, but it essentially is like a one sentence description of who you are and what your specialty is, what you do and what makes you unique at doing that. Um, you have to get very good at the subtle humble brag if you need it. Uh, and that's just a way to make sure that, hey, I'm going to be memorable and I'm also going to be taken seriously. Because if you don't do that, it's so easy for people to rely on like the, the lizard brain part of their whatever and just assume that, well, the only people that I need to talk to at this event are going to be the, the six foot tall white guy because clearly he's going to be the top of the food chain at game audio or whatever. Um, if you can find ways to short circuit that and let them know, hey, I am somebody, then that's, that's the way to go.
We have another question in chat. Uh, it says, greetings from Indonesia. I got a question on how you guys manage an effective pipeline between each audio department from creative and technical stuff. Um, it helps that it's just me. So um, tr traditionally, <laughs> I, do, I do yell at myself sometimes, um, <laughs> but it, it does help. Um, Kareem has a different opinion about it, but yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, when you're, there are plenty of projects I've been on where it's like, Kareem's the audio person, um, push it to Kareem. But no, uh, working at Bungie, as I said before, we have an audio department and we have teams within that focused on music, sound design and dialogue. And we have rituals and systems in place to understand how to check in with each other at the key moments when we need to. It's something that takes time to develop and, and figure out. Uh, it all capstones in the audio final mix stage when we are, all of the content has been checked in and we are reviewing it. There's one person who is uh, who has been given the chair of mixer, final mixer, and everybody gets to come in in their moments or sit in throughout the entire thing if they have the time and assist with the content that they themselves have worked on to try and help it sit properly in the final product. The important thing to recognize when you're working with a, a larger team is that at the end of the day, we're all sharing the same audio space. Music and sound design and dialogue may be triggering all at the same time or right after one another uh, in sequence. The players will be able to appreciate the music on its own if they're listening to a soundtrack, but if you have the most beautiful music, but it can't be heard or it's being crushed by frequency ranges and sound effects that are harming the tonality of what you're supposed to be hearing in the music, then it, the effect is lost on the players in that moment. So recognizing that we have to be a team and egos aside, when we're in final mix, somebody's stuff might get turned down. Somebody's stuff might get uh, rearranged and handled by other folks, but uh, we all know it's in service to creating the best possible completed experience. And uh, I'm, I think our team is, is really uh, awesome at it. And it's actually a really great team building exercise. We all get to listen to each other's work and, and, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, it's with excitement and cheering, you know, it's like, holy crap, you really, made an awesome sounding thing here. Um, we should make sure that has its moment to shine before we move on to the next thing. Um, and for me in dialogue, a lot of it has to do with timing. A lot of it has to do with, with adjustments just to make sure that um, we're not stepping on the toes of other people's work. Um, so there'll be these programming calls, a boss dies and there's a huge sound effects of them the giant robot falling apart. And at the same moment, the music cue shifted because that's a trigger for music to change and a dialogue event triggered to say, hey, you did it, you beat the boss. Well, that's a mess <laughs> if that all happens at the exact same time. So uh, let's give sound design its moment. Um, let's give music a chance to crescendo. And then let's put like an eight second delay on the dialogue to wait until those things have died down before somebody comes in over the radio and says, hey, great job, you, you defeated the boss. Um, and so sometimes it's very easy, but overall it's, it's a really big um, undertaking and it can be stressful at times, but it's super worth it. And just checking in before Final Mix as well, um, doing dialogue on, Destiny, we do a lot with like aliens and stuff. And we have sound designers who do the, the non-dialogue audio barks for those characters. And especially if it's like a boss or something who also talks, I will check in with the sound designers who are making that content and go, is these are the decisions we're making for their dialogue. Does that fit 
with the decisions and creative goals you have for their sound effects. Let's check in with each other as we're making this uh, to make sure that we're excited and you can borrow from my palette. I can borrow from your palette to make sure we're creating something consistent. Well, we're fast approaching uh, our, our, the end of our panel, but I'd like to go around one more time and, and get everybody's, um, uh, any final plugs you wanna do about where people can find you, what you're working on. Um, and also if you can say one thing about like, what you're really excited about right now in games, whether that's in game audio or not, just the thing that's like keeps you going and, and, and makes you excited about uh, this weird game space that we all exist in. Um, so I'll go in order of uh, folks on my screen. I know Cameron is having some difficulty with uh, their connections, so uh, hopefully they can make it back, but um, otherwise uh, I'll, I'll start with Kareem. Cool. Uh... Thank you, everyone. I, I love dialogue in general, in case that's not clear. I geek out about this stuff all the time, um, especially unique implementation systems, really cool voices um, that do really, that sound unique and interesting. I love geeking out about that stuff, especially. And I'm personally very excited that uh, I'm getting to start to go back into the office in a very safe and organized way and getting to see some of my awesome coworkers again. My favorite thing about this industry that we're in are the amazing people that I get to see and spend time with, present company included. And uh, things that I'm excited about, I'm playing Tales of Arise right now on PlayStation 5, having a lot of fun with my anime adventure uh highly recommend and uh yeah i'm probably gonna watch the new venom movie soon and hear the cool voice work they do for that because they do some amazing things with their vo vocal sound designs so uh, where can people follow you online oh yeah uh, with some of the announcements and stuff uh i've been tagged i'm at shade tooth on twitter if you want to reach out to me you can just uh, Google my name as well. Should come up pretty quick. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Wilbur? Yeah, I'm excited about Virtua Fighter and uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two. <laughs> I'm a, I, I'll talk forever if I get into why, but check them out. Play Virtua Fighter. It's good, please. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as game audio goes, you know, I really love the marriage between music and sound design. I think every single gig that I've had recently, uh, you know, from Call of Duty onward, it's because I was work, or I was speaking with a sound designer, the audio director usually, and they recognize that I'm not just in my little bubble writing music, and then it's like you must uh, appreciate my music, but instead I'm trying to find ways that the music and the sound design can coexist without fighting each other. And every game is going to have a different solution. So you have to kind of get into the mindset of, well, how is the sound design working in this game? What are the transients like? Uh, is it very ballistic or is it more like synthetic? And, and ask yourself those kinds of questions and let that influence your music writing and your arrangements. And I think that now that we're beyond the, oh, we got you know this huge name Hollywood orchestra and composer or whatever, to, now that that era is kind of over, and we're thinking more on the lines of, you know, scores like Death Stranding, where it's like, hey, here's a completely new sound that you haven't heard before, or Anthem. Uh, now it's like, okay, this is a perfect time to really examine the sound, sound by sound, what is going to fit in this game and what's not. So that's what's exciting me about the coming generation. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Wilbert Roger. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, Megan. Uh, yeah, so I'm really, really excited about uh, NDA VR things that are coming out. Uh, so unfortunately, there's not a lot that I can talk about, um, but I get to record it all this time around. And that's that's going to be really fun. Uh, experimenting with new mics that I've never really got to put into a real production is really fun. Um, I'm also work, uh, going to play Persona 5 uh for 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 work related reasons and that's really fun too and 
Um, I just, yeah, that, that, that kind of thing is just, just really exciting. Um, uh, the, there was a, like a, a question around like, um, like what, what do you do to give back to the community? Um, every Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, uh, Seattle time, Pacific Standard Time, um, I do have a Discord where I just sort of have an open coffee uh, with, with anybody who wants to, you know, get in on that. Um, and you can reach me at on accident sound on Twitter, uh, if you'd like to participate in that. So usually goes for an hour or two. I talk about everything. So pretty cool. Awesome. Um, April. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm most excited. <laughs> it's really funny because we just had someone, but I'm actually most excited for State of Decay 3. And I am a huge nerd for that game, which is really funny because we had someone from Undead Labs here. Um, that's something I'm super excited about. Also, uh, spatial audio is becoming very accessible nowadays. I am so excited for this new medium of mixing to exist. Like I'm ready to like see these new in interesting creations that will happen across like the spectrum of audio because of it. Um, uh, you can reach me at SoundlyAv on Twitter if you'd like. Uh, what else? Oh, and uh, sorry. Uh, I'm also working on Tinker Studios right now. We're doing Tinker VR, which should be coming out within in November. We think we're working towards something for Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Uh, and come out, it's 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 very much a theater experience in VR, where you get to watch a very special story between a grandfather and their son. So um, to, if you want to know more about that, go to Tinker Studios VR or Tinker, Tinker VR online and you should be able to find it. Awesome. So I, I think Cameron uh, is not able to come back on, but um, regardless, thank you all for, for being here and for lending your time and your experiences to our panel. You're all such wonderful people uh, and I, I've really enjoyed getting to chat with you today. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Ben so he can tell us the results of our charity poll as well. Can I also take one second uh, to say a big thank you to IGDA Seattle, to Seattle Indies for hosting us, to our ASL interpreters who have been doing an amazing job. Thank you to everyone participating in this panel and making it a reality. It was a very big honor for me to be here. Thank you. Kareem, I couldn't have said it better. So. Um, so just wanted to let everyone know that uh, Black Girls Code um, has been the uh, standout winner um, from tonight's, uh, for tonight's donation. Uh, so we'll be taking care of that in the next couple of days. So again, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, this video uh, will be available on uh, the IGDA Seattle uh, YouTube page. So you can go there and see recordings. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all at future events. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having us. Thank you.